Today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, strategic foresight. Figuring out what's going to happen in the future makes you more able to deal with it in the present. What we call this resiliency. It's really, really good. And Remy is an expert at how to think about the future uh, in creative ways. So uh, Remy, I'm going to hand things over to you and uh, stop taking up your precious airtime, but I'll be lingering here in the background. If you need me, have a great time and uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for the kind words. It is wonderful to see many of you. You should be able to see a lovely, lovely black screen here. I actually wanted to talk to you guys before we really even dive in and share something I'm just kind of interested and passionate about. It's, it's Roman mythology. And I hope you're confused as to why I bring that up. The Romans, like the Greeks, believed in many different gods in, in, in Roman mythology. There's one that is really, really interesting. And the one that I find so fascinating was a, a god named Janus. Janus was the god of doors and gates. This is one depiction of this, uh, this character. Doors and gates represented more than just a passageway. Doors and gates represented essentially the notion of duality. Because the cool thing about a door, if you really think about what a door is... I know I'm nerding out a bit, and I promise we'll get into some practical stuff in about three minutes here, but a door is an entrance and an exit. And if you think about it, entrances and exits are actually opposites of one another. Yet a door is somehow both. So Janus was the, the god of doors and gates, but also the god of duality, good and evil, all this kind of stuff. So the reason I share this with you, the next time you guys go to a cocktail party, for example, this is your fun fact. The reason I say this is your fun fact, Janus would be the origin of the month of January. January is the month during which we can both look forward and back at the year. I hope you find it kind of interesting, but uh, we're going to come back to Janus Cones and why I'm introducing these. I'm going to introduce myself in just a minute anyway. I put this title up about looking into a crystal ball because not what for Strategic foresight is not about predicting the future. It gets associated with this idea of predicting the future, what's coming up. It's about resiliency. It's about thinking strategically or critically about how citizen and residents' behavior and expectations might be changing, how technology is evolving, how startups and modern tech ecosystems are disrupting in the future and then building resiliency into that future plan. So while we call it foresight, it's less about knowing or predicting what's, I hate the word predicting the future. It's, it's A, we can't do it. Uh, and B, it's not the goal. So uh, this picture feels like it was just like a few weeks ago, um, but the sheer amount of hair uh, on my head there tells me that it's a decade old. Uh, the last time I had a real picture of me taken. I run a company called Thousand Days Out. We get into all kinds of weird nonsense. I'm doing program design for a global AI stuff in the Middle East. I'm doing work in clinical drug trials. They bring a foresight approach into what does the future of clinical drug trials look like? Absolutely fascinating, having so much fun with that. And I do a lot of training and workshops around AI as well, because honestly, because I love math and AI is mostly just math. In a previous life, I had a real job. I ran innovation for Mattel. My whole world for a couple of years was Barbies and Hot Wheels. I also run a, a fintech company called Olive or Help Run. And I teach a couple of different courses. So, uh, and, and if you really want to know me, uh, I also do real estate development. I'm in the early stages of building a 40 unit condo building because we need more places for people to live in Canada. So, man of many hobbies. I wouldn't say talents necessarily, because I don't know if I'm good at anything, but I do like variety. And I'm really, really have been having so much fun introducing this notion of foresight to teams and organizations because of how it's able to spark a conversation. I'll tell you my first experiences. The only real anecdote or story I'll tell was I want to get into some interactive stuff. My first experience with foresight actually came out of sheer coincidence, I was doing work with a company called Boar's Head. They are, I hope you could probably guess, they are an American company. They, they make deli meats, cheeses, but primarily meats. I was living in Toronto at the time, 
and their executive team was coming up to uh, to do a workshop with us. I was leading the workshop, leading the design project. This is about 10 years ago. No, about six years ago, I'm sorry. And as this project was coming together, something really, really funny happened. I was at Pearson Airport, everyone's favorite place, airports. I, mi I actually miss airports. I never thought I would say the words, I miss Pearson, but I do, I miss airports. I came across a magazine. The magazine I came across was not The Economist. It was a magazine called MISC, M-I-S-C. And it was a magazine called the Magazine of Strategic Foresight and Innovation. And in the airport lounge, the best thing about the Air Canada lounge, if you could say there was something good about it, was you always had a stack of free magazines. So I'd always stack up. I'd always come home with five of them. But I picked up this magazine about foresight. This was in about March of 2015. And I was leafing through it, and they had done something really interesting. They had made fake magazine covers from the future. So although if you can read the date on this picture, and you can tell I took this picture with a 2015 camera phone or smartphone, whatever, uh, I did not in my wildest dreams expect I would take that picture I just took on the spot in the airport lounge and be five years later presenting to people from all over the world all the time with this terrible picture that you can see my flash reflecting on. Had I had the foresight, uh, I would have gotten a, a better quality picture. But what they did that was so remarkable, they came up with 10 magazine covers from the future. Adweek, Forbes, The Economist. But The Economist once struck me. The headline was The End of Waste, How the Internet of Food Makes Treasure Out of Trash. Now, I was just starting this work with this, this deli meat company, and I had an idea, and an idea that got me into a lot of trouble. I said, well, what if we instead change the headline? We called it the end of meat. Back in 2015, research into uh, vegetable-based um, proteins, synthetic proteins, uh, soy proteins, pea proteins, all this, developing mostly in labs, though, and, and just starting to come up. But there were signals telling us that people were trying to get healthier. People were thinking about the environmental consequences. And I'll tell you right now, I am not a vegetarian. I'm, I call myself a weekday vegetarian. I eat meat only on the weekends. That's, that was my decision. So this is not me telling you guys we have to be vegetarians. I was working with a deli meat company. But this idea that one day meat might not exist or it might not look the same really struck me. So I had my designer take this cover shamelessly rip it off and we made a copy of the economist five years in the future with a different photo and it said the end of meat so i told you i got in trouble uh, the reason i got in trouble was i blew it up i printed it uh, eight feet tall like one of those you know those roll-up banners I probably spent four hundred dollars on the banners a little bit uh, excessive and in the studio where we hosted this workshop this team of deli meat executives from the U.S. who all flew to Toronto to, to come and do a workshop with the great Rami, obviously I kid, they walked into the room and the first thing they saw was a giant poster proclaiming the end of their industry. They didn't love it. By they didn't love it, there were some bad words said. There was someone who walked out and was quite offended by it. They calmed down, they came into the room. And I explained why we did that. And the reason we did that was because there are signals that tell us this industry is changing. The problem is when you're in the business day to day, whether it's public sector, private sector, entrepreneurship, academic, when you're in it, it's really hard to see what's happening outside. I won't go into the frog boiling um, Al Gore analogy there, but I, I think you guys are with me when I say that. So we said, we joked, we said, listen, one of our team members happened to be time traveling. They, they went to 2020, remember 2020 was gonna be better. They went to 2020, they saw this magazine and they brought it back for us. And we just thought you guys would be really interested to think about what it might mean if that future did come true. Will it be uh, 2020? 
Maybe, maybe not. Will it be 2030? Maybe, maybe not. Will meat ever completely end? Probably not. But the provocation was valid and it led to an incredible two days of not being stuck with how things are now, but thinking about how things might be later. The reason I'm sharing this example of foresight and not others is because we weren't too far off in July of 2019, Beyond Meat went public. So within about eight months of our fairly arbitrarily assigned date, a very major milestone in a change in what we as consumers eat, this was a big thing. Now, Beyond Meat was treated like a tech company, like their IPO, their sword, and a, the valuation was crazy. It was valued like a tech company. That's neither here nor there. But something that five years earlier was mostly in labs and mostly theoretical was suddenly mainstream, mainstream to the point of being a public offering, I found quite interesting. So foresight is the, the art and science both of understanding change and then systematically building resilience. And I know I just threw like, that sentence is literally buzzwords and like connectors. But if we unpack what that means, art and science, there are tools. I'm gonna to introduce you to two or three really powerful tools. The first one we introduce, honestly, you'll say to me, this is really, really simple. I don't need a tool for this. But as you go through the exercise, you might start to see it's in the simplicity that the, the importance comes. So that's the science side, right? The structured approach to foresight. But it is art. It's reading between the lines. It's critical thinking. And it's a lot of curiosity. So that's why I'd say it's art and science both. Understanding change. Well, change happens a lot of different ways. And I'll put up a picture in a moment to, to show a little bit of what I mean. This is not meant to be an academic lecture on change. But I will put it up because sometimes even just seeing it makes you realize, wow, there are really a lot of different types of change. And here's the big mouthful, systematically building or building systematic resilience. Every organization, private or public sector out there needs to be thinking about disruption to their industry. Government, corporate, startups, everyone is thinking about this. Building resilience, you can do systematically, but you need to be looking beyond the quarter, beyond the year, beyond the current political cycle and stepping back a bit. And strategic foresight is the toolkit that we have to do that. Okay, so let's unpack it a little bit. I did tell you I was gonna talk about change for a second. I'm gonna put this up and let you just kind of take it in for a second. This is a few of the types of change. There are the wild cards. What's a wild card? TikTok. People have made mobile apps for short videos before. But TikTok happened. There are cyclical changes. Fashion would certainly be in that. If you hold on to your clothes long enough, they will come back in the style. It's not a joke. It's not a stretch. It happens over and over. There are trends. There are dying changes. There's things that start off quickly and just never really take off. And every one of TikTok's competitors would be one of those. In government and public sector, it's really worth thinking about how do these changes impact us? If I made an observation about the world that we live in today compared to 20 years ago, I would compress this whole graph a little bit and say, while there are still different types of change, it strikes me that it's all happening faster. So an interesting thing when you think about open government, I know, Alistair, you talk a lot about the good, fast, cheap concept. How do governments adapt to the increasing pace of change when technology outpaces policy and legislation? It's not a question we're going to solve now. It's not the intent of this, but I wanted to kind of bring this up to just give a visual representation to this notion that there are a lot of different types of change. But instead... Speaking of things that should have changed, the QR code almost died off. It just, I didn't like QR codes. And then COVID breathed new life into this QR code. This is a real QR code. So I would ask you if you have a phone nearby, 
to give this a scan. In a moment, if you don't have a phone nearby, I will give you a URL. I would like to get some input from you guys on your perspective on this topic and how you in your various organizations and teams and departments are thinking about this, because I think it's gonna set the stage for going into some interactive frameworks. So I have two questions I'd like to ask you. The first one is very serious and very important. Uh, I can see many of you already entered here. I put this question up for two, three reasons. I've indirectly asked you how old you are because there is a very strong correlation between a person's age and who their favorite Batman is. And Ben Affleck never gets a vote. He gets the occasional pity vote. It's kind of funny. Uh, second reason why, it's fun. And I like to have fun. I hope you can tell that I, I try not to be too serious all the time. Third reason, it lets us test the technology before I put up the serious question. I want to know how your, your gut reaction is to each of these statements in, in context of your department or organization. So I'll read them out as we go through, but you can see them on your screens too. Your leadership, and you may be a part of that leadership structure, spends time thinking about alternative futures and foresight. Do you have the organizational capabilities, so the skills and the competencies to create resilient strategies and programs? The third one I find fascinating. I can't wait to unpack this. Do you think it's easier to think about the future of technology and innovation a year from now or 10 years from now? And finally, have you actually explored tools, frameworks, processes, or methodologies to think about foresight and how it might impact? It says the business, it could, because I know there's people from all different um, types of organizations on here. That could be business, that could be a public sector department, that could be nonprofit or NGO. So the, the reason I love this tool, Mentimeter, if you haven't seen it, it's real time, it's pretty, it's got a nice user interface. But what it does from a data visualization is, is wonderful. So that colored wave that you see actually shows you the breakdown. So if we kind of go in on, on the third question here, it's easier to think about the future one year from now than it is 10 years from now. It's cool seeing a handful of people say, no, not at all. Most of you agree. And the funny thing about it is, this is where averages and means are terrible data points because like, if you use like, for example, uh, Zoom, no offense to Zoom, but Zoom's built in polling. And I asked you that question, we would see an average of 2.9 out of five. And we'd think everyone kind of thinks about this the same. Actually, you guys think about this in extremes. Half of you think one thing and the other half think the exact opposite. Only one person voted in the middle around where the mean is. So anyways, I find that fascinating. With the other questions, and I don't do the like, agree strongly agree thing like not even close 10 of you voted a, a, a one or two with respect to how much time your organizational leadership which you may or may not be a part of spends thinking about foresight and thinking about the future so that's quite telling if we go to the, the next one here certainly only three people voted a three or a higher to say we have the organizational capabilities for this. And related to that question, we have the tools and frameworks. Again, only four of you voted, yes, we have this. So I hope to introduce you in, in about 4.3 minutes, a couple that you can take away. I'll give you access to the, the template versions. We'll find a way to, to distribute that to everyone if you wanna use them ever in the future on your own. But a couple of ways of thinking about this that I hope you can bring into your organization. So. With that, let's talk about some specific approaches for this. The first one, which we will do together as an exercise, we're gonna go into probably two breakout groups and we're gonna do a little experiment and we're gonna actually do this as an exercise. We're not gonna do it to completion. We'll introduce it, you'll get stuck, it'll click, you'll get stuck again, and then it'll click again for you. But it's gonna be something you have in your tool belt. The Batman analogy continues apparently to take forward into your teams, your organizations, your departments. So it's a tool called the Janus Cone. Remember Roman God of duality, Roman God of doors and gates. We're going to bring that back. The second is I want to introduce to you a little discussion around speculative design uh, and what that means. And if you haven't come across that term, don't worry. I'll explain it. 
And the third is a couple of other frameworks, one that I'm particularly passionate about. I'm going to go back and forth between calling it the rapid foresight canvas, which sounds wonderful, and foresight for dummies. And I use that in the series of books sense of four dummies, not in the judgment of any one person kind of thing. I call it foresight for dummies because you really don't have to have a deep background to work with it. It's a way that you could very practically lead an exercise within your team or organization or department and start imparting other people to think about the future. So just don't read into the four dummies thing. It's really just, I'm picturing those yellow books in my head. So let's begin with this idea of a Janus cone. In the background here, which I'll bring forward in a moment, you can kind of see uh, the core structure of it. It's a method to systematically look at trends and forces over a particular time period. And our goal in doing that, I'll give you a couple of examples of where I've seen it work incredibly well. Our goal in doing that is to uncover the underlying pattern. Generally, we start on the right, we go right to left, and we start with what does the world look like in context of whatever domain we're discussing? That could be digital payments, that could be open government, that could be freedom of information, that could be deli meats. What does it look like today? And we start working our way backwards. It's a tool to stimulate groups in terms of how they think and give people a little bit of space. Uh, we're going to spend about 15, 18 minutes on it. It doesn't have to be a full day exercise. I would suggest if you were to do this, we'll talk about some practical best practices in a moment, but I find 45 to 90 minutes is all you really need. And this is a once a year kind of thing. This is not your, a weekly meeting exercise. This is once a year at a team offsite or a team get together, or a town hall, a really, really powerful tool. So this is what it looks like blank. What we do, and whether you do it in a physical whiteboard or a tool called Mural, which we are going to use together in a couple of minutes, works in any browser. It's literally just a couple of lines on the screen. It's not a tough template to uh, replicate, but there's some genius in it. The genius in the template the way it is now is that if you're putting post-it notes, stickies, whether virtual and Mural like we're about to, or physical on a whiteboard, you actually have a lot less room near the current. The reason for that is it's a lot easier to think about what's happened the last couple of years, the last five years, than it is to think about what happened in our industry and in our domain 15, 20, 25 years ago. We have this human desire for balance and symmetry. So it almost forces you to spend more time going a little bit further back. It's a subtle thing in this tool, but I really love that that's how it's structured. This is an example of one filled in. Immediately, you can see there's still always going to be more on the right. This is related to the lottery gaming sports betting industry, in particular sports betting, because that's changing in Canada in the coming years. We don't have to read any of this, but I want to show you, here's what it looks like when it's filled in. We get all these post notes. The bold ones, you can see if you're bolded, are what happens when we spend 30 minutes, let a team all contribute to it, and we start to discuss and we say, well, that's a really interesting one. We just put it in bold, we change the color, we do whatever we have to do to kind of call it out. So we're gonna go into the exercise in 1.4 minutes from now. A couple of best practices if you wanna do this with your teams, but also for today. As far as you're thinking to look forward, you gotta go back at least twice that far. So if you're doing like a five-year outlook going on like on a go forward basis, thinking about a five-year strategy or roadmap, 10 years is, to me, a bare minimum, I'd suggest in 20 years. Some of the trends you'll uncover, and I'll give you an example in a moment, you have to zoom way out to see the trend. It's only when you start seeing the patterns over time that the trend becomes glaringly obvious. And then once you do it, you can't not see the trend. It's like the Coca-Cola thing. I don't know if you've ever seen the whole thing about the Coca-Cola logo, the way it's written, Coca-Cola Classic, and it... It looks like someone like snorting something through their nose. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, Google it. It's fine. But once you've, once you, it's like a magic eye. Once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. That's where we want to get to. What do we mean by milestones? What actually goes on here? 
This could be product launches. This could be political changes. This could be movie or pop culture references. This could be new technologies that have come to market. This could be social, historical events, uh, economic events, recessions, things like that. It could be when products became mainstream. So I I've almost never seen a Janus cone that doesn't show the iPhone being released in 2007 because it was, and I worked for BlackBerry for five years, but the iPhone was when smartphones became mainstream. And so that becomes the kind of thing. One of my favorite things to put on though, the first time you remember X, because sometimes things have happened, but it's your personal relationship with that thing that occurred. I've even seen some say the first time I voted from teams kind of really looking back. So there's all kinds of different things that can go on here, but I wanted to give some, some specifics. There's another funny thing that happens here. And I don't know if anyone's ever heard of something called either the primacy effect or the recency effect. Our brains aren't that great at remembering things. We tend to remember the beginning of lists or the end of lists, but there's another thing that happens. We tend to remember things that occurred to us that were meaningful in a somewhat skewed light. I, I spent about uh, six weeks once bumming around backpacking through Thailand and Cambodia. I often literally still say, oh yeah, like the other day when we were in Thailand to my partner, that was 12 years ago. You're not young anymore. It wasn't the other day. It was more than a decade ago. You didn't have a kid back then, but it feels so recent. So the reason I share that with you is when you start thinking about things, if you're not sure when it happened, it's worth a 13 second Google search to see when that thing happened to at least get in the right ballpark. Because you might be surprised when I tell you that eBay um, was like in the late nineties, people are like, what? eBay is more than 20 years old? Yeah, eBay is approaching like 25 years old. And that's from it being mainstream. That's probably 30 years since it was sort of a startup. So just do a quick search and then it makes it a lot easier that way. So that's just a couple of best practices. So what do we, the last thing I'll share with you, what do I mean by these patterns? I'll share a really great example. I did this exercise with a, a team of um, executives from uh, a Canadian credit union and bank just a few weeks ago. And they were talking about how payments have changed. Payments have changed a lot. We talked about the fact that I remember in my lifetime, my mom paying for groceries, a, a basket full of groceries at the grocery store with a handwritten check. Just for fun, about three weeks ago, I tried it. You should have seen the kid at this store. I honestly, I'm not exaggerating. I don't think he's ever seen a check before. It's quite possible. It, I mean, 17 or 18 years old. Had to call his manager. The manager was like, I'm sorry, sir, we don't take checks. So I took out my visa and it was fine, but I was really curious. I'm a bit of a goof and I was just curious, but to me, it was so interesting because like, I remember that used to be a thing. So as we talked to payments, we talked about paying with check, we talked about debit and credit. And then in that same Janus cone, eBay came up. eBay allowed people to sell stuff like an adding machine, a calculator, instead of the 10 kilometer radius from my house where the classifieds go, to the entire country, if not the entire world. 15, 20 years after eBay, Shopify comes along. And yes, you could run a store on eBay, but it was still an eBay store. It was never your own store. Suddenly Shopify comes along and does the same thing that eBay did for individuals, for every store in the world. So what this team really cleverly did said like, hey, eBay, Shopify, they pulled that out and abstract and they said, it's the democratization of, of, of payments and commerce really that we're talking about. It, it made everyone able to sell stuff. And I thought that was such a remarkable insight. If I just said, what are the top five forces that are going to change payments in the future? I really don't think, and this is no judgment of that team, I don't think they would have gotten to such a truly well articulated and insightful observation about this idea of democratization. So the last thing I'll share, I promise before we start this, our brains are wired for symmetry. So another thing that's genius about this code is it's kind of asymmetrical. So what ends up happening as you run through this exercise, you won't be able to help yourself. 
you're going to put post-it notes to the right of today. You're going to start saying, well, this is a thing we see starting to come. They might not be 20 years in the future, but you might start thinking about what's happening next year or two or things you've heard of or things that's being researched in the academic circles or things that another government or public sector uh, organization in, in Scandinavia is thinking about that's really forward thinking. And you might put that down as more of a, a forward trend. So there's a lot of things that are remarkable about this very deceivingly simple looking tool. So that's the last one. We can kind of reverse the cone at the end when we want to start looking forward. So with that, I would like to do an experiment with you guys. It's been too much of me talking. I'll come back to that diagram in a moment, but I want to dive in. So I created this link here. If you put this into uh, just about any modern-ish web browser, you're going to get transported to a mural board. I've typed the, the URL into the uh, chat window too, because I'm going to take this screen off and I'm going to open up this mural board. So I can see many of you are already in here. And what I'll do very briefly here to allow everyone to, to, to play around is just orient you to this tool. I've created space for three Janus cones. And in fact, I'm going to be a little bit sneaky with this tool mural and I'm going to lock all of your screens. Fun superpowers that I have. So you're now seeing the same thing I am. So whether you're following along in Zoom or you're in the tool, you're seeing the same thing I am. I've created space for two of these. And what I would like to do is ask the question, as we think about the future of public sector services and digital government, and I, I try to keep that really broad. As leaders, we have to prepare for, for new scenarios and ultimately become adaptable with the goal of becoming kind of future-proof. We can't be truly future-proof but we can be future resistant. Kind of like you don't really have a waterproof raincoat, they're water resistant. We can be resilient to changes in the future. So the first start of thinking about this is to look back what forces, trends, events, behavioral changes, maybe even have impacted this domain and the lives of, I've said citizens and residents um, in the past. I've kind of given a shortcut the milestones area there on the screen where it says product launches, new services, technology, et cetera, to help you think about this. So what we're going to do, we're going to go into two breakout groups. I will go back and forth between two breakouts. I'll, I'll do my best to help both groups. In your breakouts, if there's anyone who can't access, I would ask that one person who has the tool open, feel free to share your screen within the breakout to allow for someone who might not be able to open the tool or maybe they're joining from a tablet that doesn't work or something like that. Everyone can contribute, everyone can add post -it notes and I'll jump in and I'll kind of help share a few more best practices for the practical side of this. Welcome back everyone. We're back in the main group. Every day I have a personal challenge and that challenge is to not be told, Rami, you're on mute. So I just caught myself, but I unmuted before someone could tell me I was on mute. I think I've done it like once this month. So. Awesome job, guys. Um, I think something kind of clicked for both groups. I'm going to zoom out a bit on the screen here because we don't need to read everything out. But a couple of things I observed. Uh, I spent about half my time in each group. It's like a snowball. And so whereas sometimes you'll do a brainstorming ideation exercise where you do, okay, everyone take 10 minutes, everyone come up with their ideas, and then we'll share them back. That tends not to be as effective for this kind of exercise. I find the most effective way is to actually say, everyone kind of contribute, but talk it out as you go. Because in group two, Alistair and I started riffing off one another. In group one, Blaze, you and I started. I said something and that turned on a light bulb for you. And if you kind of talk them out, you'll start picking up some really interesting threads. So at the end, we were talking about how Me Too movement and, and, and everything around that has shaped at least maybe not government service side, but certainly the politics side of things. We started talking about energy usage, all kinds of interesting things. Blaze, can I put you on the spot for a second? I think it was you who said you gave sort of that that idea about sort of the pop culture as a as a, a thought starter. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm a foresight practitioner. I've been a foresight practitioner for almost 12 years now. 
And so I use a tool similar to this and it's a timeline where the whole point is to show people that they've lived through massive amounts of disruptive change. And so similar to this, it's kind of a timeline. And so we kind of try to segment some of the things on like a workshop board and an easy way to get people to think about, you know, how much change is theme is to start from pop culture. So you always start from like, what was your favorite song that year or that time? And then from there, build off, like, what was the tool they used the most that year? What was other things that happened in the world around that time? And that's forth and so on. So you can just build the layers of what the world looked like. That's awesome. Yeah. And I'm going to shamelessly feel that. I really like kind of starting with that. Uh, I often start with the personal stories. Like, do you remember? I know, Alistair, you mentioned 9-11. I don't think that there's a lot of people of, be, with a certain minimum age, there's not a lot of people out there who don't remember where they were. I was in my campus bookstore in my first year of university. Almost everyone, but then it kind of, again, it becomes a trigger for thinking about other things that happened around that time. So that kind of thing is powerful. One of the things I wanted to call out before we move on, because this is not a Janice Cone workshop, it's a foresight workshop, Thinking up on themes is really important. And sometimes I tend to put sort of these broader themes at the top or write them down somewhere else. But like one that came up in our group was how much choice we have, but also our, our dwindling attention spans. We all have way more screens around us. Uh, we expect things faster. I do not like Amazon. I sometimes order things from there begrudgingly because honestly, I, had, I needed a light switch yesterday. And I wasn't going to drive 20 minutes to Home Depot where I could have it the next day on my doorstep. And attention span, our expectations have changed because a couple of years ago, that wouldn't have been my expectation to just order something and not pay shipping and have it be on my doorstep in a day. So as we looked at, we talked about e-commerce, we talked about Netflix, we talked about multiple screens, iPhones, something our group, group one sort of zoomed out and took away. It was like changing attention spans. And if that trend continues, what does that mean? What does that mean for the types of government services and digital government services we need to create and offer and build for citizens, for, for residents of whatever country we're, we're working with or, or municipality or province, all levels of government. So I think that's um, certainly quite interesting and in things like COVID, I, like I said to, I think one of the groups, I've yet to see a Janus cone that doesn't have COVID on it. It's a quick, safe starting point. If, if you do this exercise, you just put it on there. You don't want to focus in all that much on one thing, especially not something super recent, but it certainly is a, it, it's a safe bet to put on there. So we're going to pick up the pace here because we went deep and I'm really glad we did, but we're going to go a little bit shallower because we've done one of these three bullets. Um, I want to talk briefly about a tool that I really love for helping people go from the foresight to how do we actually design for the future? I'm gonna introduce a tool that I really love. We won't put it to practice today and we weren't going to, but I can share links and all that stuff with you guys if you're interested. It comes from the world of speculative design or spec design. Speculative design is the field of design that like intersects with like science fiction, basically. How do we design when we don't even know kind of what that future totally looks like? Now. I put a question up and I didn't come back to you because I wanted to bring it up now. I asked you earlier about that provocation about, is it easier to think about the future one year from now or 10 years from now? The reason I put that up as a question for you is because I read it in a book, but the book said it's easier to think about the future 10 years from now. And I dug my heels and I was like, no, it's not. Everything changes so fast. My gut reaction was to very much disagree. I didn't throw the book in the trash. I kept reading it. And by the end of that chapter, I was sold. It is actually in some ways, if we take certainty out of the question and strategic foresight is not about certainty, it's about resilience. It's not about predicting, it's about adapting. If we take certainty out of the question, it is actually easier to think about the future 10 years from now. So the example in this book, and I cannot for the life of me remember the name of the book, but I can look it up afterwards if anyone wants to read it, was sensors. If we did a Janus cone about the explosions of sensors, especially connected sensors in our lives, in our homes, in smart cities, in our cars, in municipal infrastructure, in sewage systems, they're everywhere. 
that trend has been on the rise. It's, it's literally why we need 5G networks. 5G gets sold to consumers as faster internet. It's not, it's lower latency internet that makes it better for billions of sensors to connect to wireless networks. Um, if we're trying to think, what does the future look like from a sensor infrastructure a year from now? It's really challenging. There's a lot of different versions of that future. But if we look to what it looks like 10 years from now, it's certainly easy to imagine more sensors everywhere even in our bodies, in our clothes, in our food, working back, is that seven years from now or three years from now or two years from now? That's really challenging. But 10 years from now, you can say with some level of confidence, there will be significantly, potentially exponentially more sensors in the world around us. So speculative design is the field of design and it is very closely related to foresight of designing for that future. To do that, we need new tools. You can't, you can, but it won't work well. You can't take a team, do a nice, like let's COVID aside, we're in a boardroom, we got a nice big whiteboard, everyone has Sharpies and post notes and say, okay, let's all brainstorm uh, a new way of getting your driver's license for 10 years from now and say, everyone go. You're just not gonna get the results you're looking for, quite honestly, because it's not how our brains are wired. We, we, we think of our norms. So there are ways to bring emerging technologies because this, this session is meant to kind of combine foresight and emerging technologies. There are ways to bring emerging technologies into this. So this is another mural board. This is a screen capture of one. You can't go in here. I can send you a link to it after. But this is a tool I run with teams all the time. This one is specific to artificial intelligence, AI, and machine learning. But you can easily apply it to any aspect of sort of emerging technology. You could do it with cryptocurrencies and distributed ledgers. You could do it with cybersecurity. The way it works, there, there's four parallel teams all working on different problem statements, but the way it works is in the top left, I've written a problem statement for the team and it's framed as a how might we statement with some nice good design thinking language. The first one is how might we use AI to improve the diversity and equity of our workforce? Step one, problem statement. Step two, someone would double click on this blue capabilities ideation cards and they would get this PDF open. This is an ever evolving deck of cards. Uh, it lives as a PDF, but I, I also tend to print it out when I can do in-person workshops. So we're constantly adding new cards to it. Uh, there's 65 pages and there's about 30 different cards and each card has a front and a back. The front of each card proposes a what if statement. In this case, they're, they're tailored to AI machine learning, but they don't have to be. You can create tools like this on your own. Uh, and there are many out there, these sort of creativity prompts cards. I'm just showing you a technology oriented one. So what if you can recognize and respond to a user's body and facial gestures? That's the what if. The back of each card, which is to the right, shows examples of companies, startups, government agencies, uh, municipalities who are using that what if that technology to solve a problem or create a product offering or service okay so we have the cards we have the problem statement if we were to zoom in this is a different problem statement so i wanted to show you like you can do it for anything even goofy examples i love this one for workshops how might we use ai to help an individual run their first ever marathon if i just put that up on a board and said everyone come up with ideas i'd come up with some but they all kind of start to look and sound the same. And that's what happens with brainstorming and ideation, especially when we are working. I can't emphasize this enough with technologies that not everyone gets fully. So the magic comes when we take the problem statement, we open up that deck of cards and we say, and it's a lot better in person, but it works virtually and say, okay, group, you've gotten the uh, card that says, what if you can analyze large data sets to identify patterns and most important features? So the second row in. So I have them write down the what if statement or one of the wide post-its. And then I time box. So you got 90 seconds to come up with as many ideas as you can. One person came up with the ideas. I know it's a bit hard to read, so I'll read it to you. Personalized training based on data mining of other athletes with a similar body shape, body type, or progress. Well, that's cool. Would someone have come up with that idea without that prompt? Maybe, maybe not. Would they have come up with this diverse group of ideas? Almost for sure not. So 
we take a problem statement, we infuse these constraints, in this case, technology prompts, but it doesn't have to be. And then we start to spin up ideas. This is a tool from the world of foresight and speculative design. It is far from the only one, but I wanted to share with you as a way of sort of saying, how do you get people thinking about kind of to the right of that Janus column, thinking about the future of it and designing solutions that may be reliant on technologies that are not fully mature yet and certainly not mainstream. So that's the very short primer on spec design. The last thing I wanted to do today, and I wanna make sure we have a couple minutes for questions. I wanted to introduce you one of my favorite frameworks. I told you before, I called it the, uh, sometimes the rapid foresight canvas. I have a version of this in Mural that I can share the link to. You can duplicate it from there and use it with your teams. I've made some changes. This is someone else's, it's licensed Creative Commons. I've modified it a little bit for how I look at things, but I also call this foresight for dummies. And again, for dummies as a brand, not judging anyone working with the tool. I call it that because it's very, very sequential. You literally go in order and fill in the boxes. It's not a template. You can't do this alone. It needs a team. It brings in some of the thinking from the Janus cone. So if you've done a Janus cone exercise, you might take that exercise and fill in some of the trends or themes you saw from there into box two. If you haven't done that and you don't have time, you see you have a two hour workshop and you want to do this with your team. Well, you spend 15 minutes on box two emerging trends and you, you see what you come up with. It won't be as comprehensive as a Janus Cone exercise, but that's fine. The left side of the box, those five, or of the canvas, those five, are really thinking about the future. This is the foresight bit. Okay, this is what are the trends? What is the customer, citizen, resident? consumer, stakeholder, whatever it is of the future look like? What does she or he or they care about? What are their needs and values? What are their current and new experiences and expectations? So this is really the thinking part. The second, I, I call it half, and I've physically rearranged it in my mural. I, I tend to say on the right, but this, the kind of next big rectangle, not the three on the right. This is how do we make this real? This is the what. What are the capabilities and resources that we need? What are the talent, skills, competencies, people that we need? Are there new business models? Are there technologies that either currently exist, maybe they'll exist in labs, maybe in academic circles, maybe they're becoming mainstream, maybe they are mainstream. What are the technology capabilities we don't currently have that we'll need to bring that future to life? The column on the right is the making it real piece. Honestly, it's a reframing of essentially start, stop, continue. What do we need to start doing? What do we need to stop doing? What do we need to keep doing? I love the word destroy though. In box 15, what do we need to destroy? What's blocking us from either having the time, the resources, the urgency or the drive to do this thing? And that is a challenging thing. There are myths you will have to bust in your organization, your department to say, well, we always have to do this. As an example, I do work in clinical drug trials. As drug trials go from being at trial sites where you might go in for an injection or a pill or a consult with an investigator or physician, they're becoming digitized and virtualized. Oh, I don't like, like to work. So you might be doing it online and you might be filling in your feedback on that experimental drug through an app on your phone. In the organization I'm working with, there is a deeply embedded and incorrect myth that says everything we create has to work for offline access. That myth has its roots in the internet of 10 years ago, where we didn't have primarily ubiquitous internet. I know there are parts of the world, there are parts of Canada where the internet coverage is, is not perfect at times or a lot of the time. However, where they struggle is shifting their thinking from always offline to online first, creating experiences that start with assumption of online, fail gracefully when they're offline. And if anyone has a technical background, building mobile applications, web applications that completely work offline adds massive layers of complexity, time, cost to them. It doesn't have to be our default mode of operating. 
So quite often, what you have to destroy in the present isn't a product, a service, an offering, a capability. It's quite often a myth that lives in the heads of your leaders, your executives, uh, your team members, your constituents, your stakeholders. It's tough. I find that is the hardest thing to do. But the first part of that is to say, well, identify. Guys, there's this deeply held belief. And where it gets really interesting, it often lives in the organization. It lives with the people who are the most senior, not necessarily the most senior like hierarchically, but it's the people who have been there for 20 years. And I know in government public sector, there's a lot of people who you know civil servants and are passionate about what they do. They've been there for 20 years. Breaking presumptions, assumptions, and myths that are in their head is very challenging. But I love that the word destroy is on here because I think that's a big part of it. There's one more kind of lens that I sometimes use on this. Now, next, never. It's another way of approaching foresight. If you ever just have 20 minutes with your team, it's not a full strat planning, it's not a five-year roadmap, but you just want to start people thinking about this stuff. I'm going to skip ahead to sort of some closing slides here in a second uh, to be respectful of your time. If you just want, you don't even need a template. If you just want to get people starting to think like this, ask three questions to your team, to your stakeholders, to your constituents. What's important now? What's important next? What's important never? If you spent five minutes thinking about those three questions each, 15 minutes, you will start to get the early buy-in you need to bring a more comprehensive approach to foresight like the one on the screen here. And I'm going to kind of turn the screen off for a second to see your faces for a moment here. But quite honestly, getting leadership buy-in for thinking about the future is a big part of this because it's not something many of you have said, you don't do this. You, you haven't had a chance to do this. What's important now, what's important next, what's important never is an amazing, simple thought and starter. You can call it WIN What because they all make the same acronym. Fun fact, I recently did that exercise uh, with a client, but it was all in French uh, as a Quebecois client. The unfortunate thing is it doesn't translate with nearly the same beauty of uh, like almost alliteration, now, next, never, because it's like three different words. And still, the exercise still works, but man, it, it is nice to say now, next, never. I leave that with you sort of as a, as a closing tool in your toolkit. You don't need a template. Make a PowerPoint slide with those three questions on it. Just start a discussion on it. You'll be blown away by what happens, especially when you put the what's important never. Because the follow-up is, well, wait, why are we still doing this? And you start to get to the myths. You start to get to what's holding an organization back from thinking more critically about the future and adapting to it. So I want to pause there. I'm more than happy to share some of the stuff I've shown you as other people's. It's Creative Commons license. More than happy to share it. I, I just love knowing that other people might use some of this. Uh, I've got a couple of nice little HBR articles about foresight. I don't believe that Harvard Business Review is the be all end all of authentic voice of what is good and what is bad in the world of business. But I do believe that if you're trying to convince someone of your approach and you want some buy-in and you can show an HBR article validating your approach, it makes your life a bit easier. So I'll share a couple of those resources as well. I feel like we're just scratching the surface of this. If people decide they want to change their careers and, and get into foresight how did you learn this stuff like what's your favorite resource for this stuff i always want to ask blaze for his because i'm not like i i don't think I get to call myself a futurist i just started started learning and building some tools on my own and reading what others have done the that magazine was great but they don't make it anymore I'm called misc but i don't know maybe blaze can i put you on the spot and pass that question to you and can ask because you're this is all you do how did you get into it Accidentally, I was in an organization that became a foresight organization, and as a result, we all trained as uh, futurists. So, uh, good point. If you're in the government Canada, there is uh, Policy Crisis Canada, which is one of the leaders in foresight, and probably one of the leaders in the world in foresight. There is also a bunch of organizations thinking about the future. OCAD has a program, a master's level program in, in foresight and, and design. Austin 
what is it? The uh, is it the Houston University yes. has a program. Uh, what's his name? Oh, it's a bit yeah. shorter too. That one. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. You could take it as like a specialization, just like a like a three day thing. The Conference Board of Canada brings that guy up. Thank you, yeah. Peter Bishop. I do sessions with the Conference Board. And he's great. So I sat in on one of his at one point because I actually have a session with them next week too. So not on foresight, but other stuff. Yeah. So. OCAD SFI, it's literally called Strategic Foresight and Innovation, but it is a master's, like that's a big commitment. But in Houston there, there's some cool online programs where uh, they call it more futures thinking. It's certainly worth looking into. And if you're in auto, there's also the Carleton University has a, a program. There's like tons of resources. Right? Like, yeah. One of the things I found most fascinating, uh, I'm reading this book, I just put it in chat called Super Forecasting. But Super Forecasting came out of this thing called um, the Good Judgment Project where they took a bunch of like forecasters and they took a bunch of people who are just re regular muggles, but really, really good. And they took a, like across a whole bunch of people, they found some people that are just really good at eliminating their cognitive biases from decisions. And they followed those people. And it turns out that like some small percentage of us are really, really good at predicting the future, like better than almost anyone else. And then they have like a panel of those people. And so much of it was about removing cognitive biases. Because and it really does underscore like now that we're in even bigger filter bubbles than we used to be because of the internet, have we consequently gotten worse at, at forecasting the future because we are, our biases are so reinforced? Like, is the internet making us dumber as a species in our ability to forecast because we are, we, we have to fight those biases so much harder, I think is a fascinating question. Yeah. And if anyone wants to, it's not exactly foresight, but if anyone just wants to read or, or check out one other inspiring and fascinating project out there. There's a group building a 10,000 year clock. They're building a physical clock that is intended to run for 10,000 years. And I find fascinating because it's foresight is about thinking longer term. And we live in a world of semi-disposable Ikea furniture. I, I literally like Ikea furniture is great. It's cheap, but when you disassemble it once, you won't get it back together, at least not without a lot of creaking moving. And this notion of building things for the long term, I find fascinating. We could spend another half hour here, but you guys all have meetings, you're busy people uh, to go to. Thank you, Alistair and Rebecca. Uh, please get in touch with me. I'm, I'm more than happy to chat more. Yeah, thank you, Remy. And we'll wrap up now. As you said, everyone's got places to go. What an amazing way to kick off a morning though. We love being able to do this kind of stuff. It's one of the things that one of the reasons we created Forward 50 was to try and build these opportunities for uh, smaller, more intimate discussions. The one thing I would ask of all of you, uh, we are all inundated with requests for our time and attention. So if you can tell other people, hey, I did this thing with Forward 50, it was really useful. That would help us get people to read those emails when we send them out. And if you haven't already, we currently have a survey on the future of digital government. It'll take 10 minutes to fill out. It's on all of our socials. We, we do this content survey every year. We have a very hard time getting people to actually fill the darn thing out, but we do think that it's a pretty useful uh, use of our time and we solicit feedback on that. I'm gonna paste it in the chat, but I uh, would love it if you would give us 10 minutes of your time. Remy, thank you as always, fascinating stuff. And I know I'm gonna be using these tools myself. So really appreciate you uh, finding the time to do this for us and bring this knowledge to everyone else. Uh, have a great uh, day, everybody. Have a great week. And hopefully we'll see you online for something else soon. Thanks, guys.